I was around eight or nine and in my childhood bedroom, which backed up to the woods. It was late at night and I stirred because a light came in through my window. A big, bright, yellowish light that shone through the entire window. I thought it was weird and turned to face the other way, away from the window. I didn't hear any noise at all, but I suddenly felt something crawl into my bed next to me. I was very awake, not sleep paralysis or anything. I felt the bed go down as they got in and felt it touch my arm, but barely. I was absolutely terrified not knowing what the fuck was happening. I tried to pretend like I was sleeping still and turned a little bit and there was an alien laying next to me. It was a greyish colour. I barely saw it because I was looking through the slit in my eyes. I can still, till this day, remember my heart beating out of my chest and telling myself to control my breathing or it would know I was awake. I then made a plan to run as fast as I could to my parents' room that was outside my door and across a landing. I counted down, three to one, and took off so fast. I threw my door open and didn't look back again. My parents had two sliding doors for their bedroom doors, and I ran so fast, I actually slammed into them, breaking the lock. My mom and dad saw the panic and they actually believed me, although they thought a human was in our house, not an alien. They searched the house from top to bottom and didn't find a thing. My mom still brings it up from time to time and now believes it was some kind of extraterrestrial or paranormal being. As I've gotten older, I have some weird gifts. Sometimes I know when something is going to happen or predict running into people or big events. I'm also really skilled at tarot reading, kind of weird abnormal gifts. I've always have wondered if the two things are tied but my grandmother also had these gifts like I do. Just weird and interesting. I've always wa wondered why it didn't grab or chase me. For a few years now, I've seen things out of the corners of my eyes, which I've always just brushed off as the casual seeing something out of the corner of your eye. Since I didn't particularly believe in ghosts, but I had some doubts. But the thing is, every time I see something, it's always at the entrance to my bedroom. Last night, I went to bed early and then woke up in the middle of the night, somewhere around two o'clock. And I just decided to stay up for a while longer since I wasn't tired anymore. After around an hour of just being on my phone, I heard my door open. So I looked up expecting to see my dad, but instead, I saw a dark hand reaching around my door and it flipped my light switch off and closed the door again. I immediately got up and opened my door to ask my dad if that was him, but no one was in the hallway. I called out to my dad and got no answer. He was asleep. I knew it wasn't my brother because he wouldn't have been able to get out of the hall and go down the stairs fast enough for me not to notice him. But since I didn't want to jump to the conclusion of the supernatural, I decided I'd ask both of them in the morning. Fast forward and they both tell me it wasn't them. They are the only other people in the house except me. But then my dad also mentions that I woke him up from talking to my brother last night. I hadn't been talking to my brother last night. I denied it and told my dad he was probably just hearing me call out to him after my light turned off. So I asked him about what time this happened and it lined up with what I said. My dad still didn't believe me and told me he specifically heard someone talking back to me. But my brother was asleep and I know for a fact that he wasn't talking to me. I obviously would have noticed that and my brother also denied it. So my dad heard someone who wasn't my brother talking to me and I feel like it's possible it could have been the voice of what was at my door. I don't know anything about paranormal stuff so could someone please explain the possibilities? I'll refrain from discussing the background of these events since this was and still remains a sensitive issue. But to give context, the 1984 anti-Sikh riots, also known as the 1984 Sikh massacre, was a series of organized programs against Sikhs in India following the assassinations of Indira Gandhi by her Sikh bodyguards. 
The assassination of Indira Gandhi was in retaliation to her order to the Indian Army to attack the Hamandia Sahib complex in Amritsar, Punjab in June 1984. The ruling Indian National Congress Party had been in active complicity with the mob as the organization of the riots. Now back in the 80s, my mother was still a teenager and lived with my grandfather in Patna, Bihar. Their immediate neighbors were a Sikh couple who had two young daughters about my mother's age. I'll refer to the father as F and mother as M. They were the kindest people you'd meet. When the violence broke, Patna mostly remained unaffected. Yet for safety purposes, my grandfather advised F to change the house plate name to a Hindu one. He complied. He didn't go out in broad daylight and all phone calls were routed to our house. But there was a problem. Emma had been visiting Delhi with her two daughters at the time, which was the worst affected by violence. One night, my grandfather picked up a call that made his blood run cold. It was Em on the phone. Em's brother, whom she was visiting, had gone out looking for food since the rations had run low and hadn't returned since the morning. To make matters worse, some INC workers had painted the letter S on the front door. This meant they had marked the house as belonging to a Sikh family and would return at night to kill them. If someone saw her removing the sign, she'd have probably been killed instantly. My grandfather, being a practical man in these matters, told her to shut all the blinds, switch off the lights, and to hide the girls under a cupboard. She complied. After a while, she peeked through the window to see an angry mob breaking into houses and setting them on fire after murdering the residents inside. It was later determined that INC workers had been provided voter lists that helped them identify and target Sikh people. She broke down. Suddenly, the curtain partition let in a beam of moonlight that illuminated a framed painting of Guru Nanak Ji, the founder of Sikhism and first of their gurus. Taking this as a sign, she wept and prayed, Maha Guruji, have mercy. If not me, save my children. Then she waited. Nothing happened. No one knocked on the door. For some inexplicable reason, the crowd had ignored her house and moved on to the next one. Maybe because they couldn't see the S in the dark. Maybe someone forgets to chuck the voter list. I don't know, and neither does she. All we know is that she and her daughters were safe. Her brother came round the next morning and told her that some good Samaritans had saved his life by hiding him in their house. While studying occult and palmistry, I had a friend who was a senior in age and an accomplished astrologer. I'll call him M. M had the ability to predict anyone's past present and future accurately, merely by looking at their horoscope, called Kundli in India. But this ability was more a curse than a boon. Em had read his own Kundli and understood clearly that his fifth house was severely afflicted. This meant that his firstborn child would suffer immensely throughout her life. Hence, when he reached a marriageable age, he put forth a condition before his parents. He would personally judge the Kundli of the woman he was going to marry. Now at least in Bihar, where we lived, Kundli matching is serious business. Most arranged marriages take place only on the basis of horoscope matching. In some cases, the woman and man haven't even met each other till their wedding night. This was M's case. He only had the woman's Kundli to judge them from. No meetings, dates, etc. He took a while and finally chose a woman whose kundli foretold she was to be the mother of the healthiest child there could be. He hoped that her kundli would be able to offset the bad luck foretold by his own. When he finally met her, he felt something was amiss, but chose to ignore those instincts since they had already been married. A few years later, she gave birth to a baby boy. Unfortunately, the baby had a birth defect that left him almost disabled. M was anguished by this turn of events. He had taken every step to mitigate this event, yet it came to pass. 
It also felt as if destiny was taunting his astrological abilities. He angrily confronted his wife, who broke down and confessed the truth. Her original Kundli was terribly afflicted too. In fact, it was so bad, she had been getting rejected from every family she had sent her horoscope to. So, her parents contacted an astrologer who made her a fake Kundli that was faultless. And the same was presented to M for inspection. And hence, destiny, being all-powerful, brought together two people to share their common fate. M later accepted his fate and started taking good care of his son, whom he regarded as a result of God's will. Chudail is a mythical or legendary creature resembling a woman, which may be a demoniacal revenant said to occur in South Asia and Southeast Asia, particularly popular in India Bangladesh and Pakistan. The Chirel is typically described as the ghost of an unpurified living thing. But because she is often said to latch onto trees, she's also called a tree spirit. They're said to have backward feet. In the early 1970s, my granduncle had got a government job with Varanasi's civic body in Uttar Pradesh, India, that was far away from his home in Ranchi, Jharkhand. Being young and unmarried, he rented a small house near his office and started living alone. At night, he used to stroll around the banks of River Ganges. One such night, he heard a woman crying. Upon looking around, he found an old woman in white sari, sobbing alone under a tree, just like a cliche Bollywood horror movie. The woman told him she was a widow. Widow women have to wear white and that she had been abandoned by his son under the influence of his wife. My granduncle, being a kind fellow, told the woman she could come home with him, and do the household chores like cooking and cleaning, etc. The woman happily accepted. My great grandma wasn't impressed by what my granduncle did and warned him to keep an eye on the woman. The initial few days passed without any incidents, but things soon took a dark turn. The woman did all the household chores decently, but my granduncle found the food cooked by her to be abysmal in taste. The food increasingly got inedible, and he even complained about the quality of food to her, but in vain. One day, he decided to spy on her. Instead of leaving for the office, he hid in a corner and peeked into the window while the old woman was preparing food. What he saw inside was blood curdling. The old woman was preparing dough. She was mixing her own shit with the dough and was kneading it with her feet. And her feet were turned backwards. As soon as the woman noticed my granduncle's presence, she disappeared. Granduncle says he fell sick with high fever for 10 to 12 days after the event, unable to believe what had happened to him. It took an occult practitioner who performed a Jada ritual, a minor exorcism, to get him back to normal. The club and I decided to go ghost hunting again for Halloween. Against my better judgement, lol. The story isn't as long, but still really creepy. So this time, we decided to go hunting off campus and instead drive down some of the haunted roads near campus. The first road we went down is nicknamed Crybaby Road, because according to the legend, a woman hung her baby there and you can hear her wailing. We didn't hear any wailing, but the ghost did tell us to leave by saying turn left when we got to the end of the road, lol. The second road we went down was the scariest and probably the spookiest part of the night. The road which I call H Road is haunted by school children and a bus driver. According to the legend, the school bus accidentally went off road, crashing into multiple trees before stopping at one large tree. This killed the bus driver instantly. The bus then burst into flames, killing all the children inside. They now all haunt the road. As we drove there, we were all vibing in the car, shooting the shit. But the closer we got, 
the more dread we began to feel. I felt very overwhelmed and felt like I was choking back sobs as we got closer. I had my phone out and was running my spirit box slash detection app. The app lets out an audible beep that gets more frequent and louder when you get to a ghost. As we drove up the road, the beeping got louder and faster. We stopped and were about to make the turn down onto the road when the spirit box app let out a very clear, God, no. Needless to say, we shit our pants and booked it out of there. As we did, one of our group members who I'll call V was pulling tarot cards to try and communicate with spirits. She pulled the devil card. We all collectively started freaking out in the car, which was when it got slightly worse. Kay, who was our driver, her Google Maps lost signal and started telling her to turn around. It wouldn't redirect, just kept telling her to make a U-turn. We got the heck out of there as fast as we could. As we got further away from the road, everybody in the car started talking about how they felt like a weight had been lifted off of them, or that the tension they were feeling was suddenly gone. I didn't feel the same relief for most of the car ride. I just felt really sick and like I was going to burst into tears. I don't know if I was just super shaken or what it was, but I only felt better when we returned to campus. Right beside the road sat a house, dilapidated from time, and Mother Nature had long begun her work to erase what man built on her land. Today, it's gone. Burned down by some teenagers doing things they shouldn't have. But in the late 30s, the little house was a scene of horrible crime. Two elderly sisters called it home then. One day in the summer, a convict that escaped from a chain gang called it a hideout from the law. He thought he was alone in the house till he found the sisters hiding in the closet. Nobody knows why he did it, but the police described it as one of the most terrifying scenes they ever investigated. We used to call it the witch's house because you could hear the screams from the two sisters when you walked by it. And if you've read some of my other posts, then you know about the woods that were just behind it. The newspaper described in detail the crime scene. My grandfather kept a copy of it, and I remember it reading it like a Stephen King novel. The two women were found on the living room floor. One body was cut to pieces with the head, arms, and legs removed from the body. The other body had been stabbed multiple times and then cut open with the innards removed and placed beside the body. The limbs of the other body were found in the kitchen, bathroom, and bedroom with the head found in the trash can. Blood covered everything in the house. The convict was named as were the two women, but I won't use their names. The convict was found in the attic in a panic-like state, covered in blood and was crying how the two women attacked him. His statement read, they came at me like they were possessed and moved faster than any human could move. They were chanting in a tongue he couldn't understand and told him he was to be sacrificed. The convict had several stab wounds, bite marks, and claw marks over his body, and died later at the hospital of an apparent heart attack. The article went on to say that before his death, he told police that he got away from the women, and they turned on each other, and that one gutted the other before she died from her wounds. He said after that, it was quiet for a moment, so we came out only to find the body of one still trying to move after death and was still chanting. So he got an axe and cut it to pieces. And when he removed the head, she was still chanting. To this day, there's one part of this crime that is yet to be answered. There were markings on the walls and the old lady's blood that were described as rune-like symbols. They were written with two fingers and blood was found on the fingers of a severed arm that seemed to be the fingers used to draw them, meaning the old lady had written them in her and her sister's own blood. The other strange thing is there were five reports the same day of convicts escaping the chain gangs, finding a house with two elderly women staying in them, and out of all of them, this is the only convict that seemed to survive. 
The others were killed by the elderly women. The summer of 1992 was the best summer ever for me. Just graduated high school and came the fall, I was going to start work with a construction company making very good money. A lot of celebration went on that summer and one particular night after celebrating through a fifth of Jack Daniels, we decided to go spook hunting as we called it. So with the Ouija board in hand, we set off for the witch's house. It seemed at the time the perfect place and one that we never ventured to before. There were three of us and soon we found ourselves standing at the back door of the shack of a house. On this night, it was quiet all around. No crickets calling, no frogs talking, no dogs barking, and no traffic on the road, which I remember was odd, because it was a major state road. It was way too quiet, as they say. With a knife and a crowbar, we managed to break in. The house had been boarded up ever since I could remember. Inside, we used flashlights to look around. You had to watch where you stepped because as I found out, the floor had rotted in places. In the living room sat an old coffee table among trash and boxes of things scattered about. We decided to use it to play with the Ouija board. Coincidentally, I'll never own another Ouija board, nor will I ever allow another one in my home because of this story. We started off with yes and no questions. Is there anyone in the house with us? The board said yes. Would you like to talk to us? Again, it said yes. Are you okay? The board said no. What happened? It spelled out killed. Is there anything we can do to help you find peace? The board said yes. What can we do? The board spelled out die. The silence of that night was broken with the sounds of laughter that seemed to be coming from everywhere. A whisper at first, and it grew louder and louder. Our flashlights were going all around while we were trying to figure out where the laughter was coming from. That's when we started seeing the dried blood on the walls. We rushed for the back door, trying to jump over the rotted places and moving as fast as we could. When we got outside, we were faced with an orb floating just in front of us and moving as if to force us back inside. We scrambled and fell over each other, trying to get away. We left so fast we forgot the Ouija board, which was fine by me at the time. The orb chased us to the edge of the road, then vanished. We stood there on the side of the road, as if we were playing hide and seek, and we made it to base and nothing could get us. Looking at the old shack, the laughter turned to screams so loud it must have woke someone up and they called the cops. The walls of that shack were shaking and we could hear things breaking inside. I could swear I saw someone moving around inside. When the police came, you could still hear the screaming. They asked what was going on and naturally we lied. We were walking by and could hear it too. We were scared to go up there to see what was happening. That was our story for the night. The policeman walked up to the house and knocked on the door. The screams stopped suddenly and the silence fell over everything again. Nobody answered the policeman, so they kicked the door in. We watched as the cop walked in and we could see his flashlight shine inside. The dried blood on the walls was gone. He came back out and walked up to us, still standing on the side of the road. I found out this is some kind of prank. All of you are going to be in a lot of trouble. We all just looked at each other in shock, not knowing what to say. I know you all have been drinking, and I can take you in right now for being underage. I said as you go home and don't let me catch you out here again. The policeman left and so did we. In shock after what just happened, we all felt that the night was done for us, and it was time to call it quits. My house was just a couple of blocks down the street, so it wasn't very long before I was home. I think all of us sewed it up real quick when things started happening. Nonetheless, when I got home, I fell asleep pretty quick. The next morning started off normal. Other than the headache from Uncle Jack, it was starting off like nothing had happened. Until one of the guys called me. Hey, did you get the Ouija board? No, I replied. I think we left it. Man, don't try to be funny, he said back to me like he was getting mad. What the hell? Nobody had the Ouija board when the cop came last night. 
So I know we left it in the house. By now, I was wondering what was going on. And how in the hell did it find its way back to my house? I was sitting on the back porch in the swing. Those woods hide many a dark secret. Some you don't want to know. To the teenagers that burned that house down a couple of years ago, I don't know what happened when you went in there, but I hope reading this, you know you aren't the only ones that had something happen. I hope what you did ended whatever supernatural thing was in there, but that house may have been a container holding it in. And what you did may have freed it instead. I hope not. Time will tell. So earlier this year, my family and I went to my mum's hometown for a holiday. We live in a different country now, and it's a really nice getaway. And something strange started happening. We stayed at the house my mum grew up in, which was quite big front garden and a massive back garden, like most people in that area do. When you go to the back garden, you have the neighbour's gardens on the left and right. And at the back, there's an area which if I understand correctly, people share and use for their cows and or horses. Behind this shared area, there's a massive forest. Opposite the front of the house, there's a road, which is just outside the house. And on the other side of the road, there's a lot of hills, with many private areas, which are mainly used for animals and living. Anyway, we were there for just over two weeks, most of which we spent in the house due to the COVID isolation rules. We mainly spent this time outside, either playing or cleaning the garden, cutting the grass, chopping down old tree branches, etc. Every now and then, I would hear this really weird noise. The best way I can describe it is a human laugh mixed with a dog's or wolf's howl. It would last for about two to three seconds before stopping. Sometimes it would be about five of these laughs in a row. Sometimes it was only one. To make it even weirder, it was quite loud, but it sounded like it was coming from far away. However, everything echoed if it was loud. Everything from a person shouting to an ambulance's sirens and train siren, is that how you call it? Would echo. So the sound had to be coming from nearby, and yet it sounded like it came from so far away. The thing is, it looked like I was the only one reacting to this sound in any way for the first couple days. So I asked my mum if she heard the sound, and she said she didn't, but it was probably some sort of animal. So I kept an eye out over the next few days to see if I could spot it. However, all I could see was cows, horses, sheep, goats, chicken and pigs, none of which could make that sound. The sound kept happening very randomly and irregularly over the duration of our stay. And for a long time, it seemed I was the only one hearing it. Until I realised my brother was reacting to it as well. I asked him what he was reacting to, and he described the same sound I was hearing. Okay, now the light. The toilet is actually outside. Even though we're currently renovating the house and started building a toilet inside. And I needed to go to one night. So I grabbed a torch and out I went. As I look up at the sky, I see this light the size of a big star, but it was L-shaped. I thought I was half asleep, so I ignored it. So I went to the toilet, did my business, then started walking back towards the house. I stopped to look back at the place where the star was, and now it looked like a square U. Sort of like an L and an inverted L right next to it. As I was wondering about what it could be, I heard the laughter again. I pointed the torch towards where I thought it came from, but then it started coming from all around me. Call me what you want, but I got scared, so I just sprinted to the house. But yeah, this is it. Both my siblings are still in school, and every morning, my mum and I help them get ready. And then my mum drives my brother to school while my sister takes the bus. While they were getting ready, my mum popped these half-baked mini baguettes into the oven. After they were ready, we took them out and my sister turned the oven off. 
Both my mum and I double checked to make sure it was definitely off. Anyway, it got to the point where they all left, so I decided to clean up a little bit. I took a little break to use the toilets and turned the kitchen light off as I left. While I was doing my business, I heard a strange noise coming from downstairs. The best I can describe it is a sheet of paper being ripped, but very loud. I went downstairs as soon as I could to check what happened. I realized that the light in the kitchen was on, even though I'm 100% sure I switched it off. And the oven was also on, which as mentioned before, my sister turned the oven off and then two people double checked and it was actually off. Nothing else was moved or was out of the ordinary. I told this to my mum when she got back, but she just laughed. I get this might have left the light on, but as I said before, I'm sure I turned it off. But the oven? Three people were sure it was off. And it's one of those ovens where you have to twist the knob to whatever temperature you want or need. So it's almost impossible to turn it on or off by mistake and without realizing. A few years ago, I met a new friend. I'll call her Leia. As soon as I met Leia, I felt a connection. There were so many things that I liked and admired about her. Plus, she really helped me through a very desperate and upsetting experience in my life. We both also shared the all too common illness of depression for many years. We both had survived some pretty hard times. Leia had a lot of experience with trauma, hers and others, a lot. After many of those dreadful traumatic experiences, she decided to uproot herself. She moved away and she changed practically everything about her life. A few months later, one night I had an experience, kind of like a dream, but it was like no other dream I've ever had. I've also had experiences with sleep paralysis and it wasn't that either. In this experience, I couldn't see anything. There wasn't anything to see or hear. Nothing ominous about it. It was like those senses weren't really operating or necessary. But I could just sense another presence with me. I could sense a friend and female. But beyond that, no real identity. But that wasn't a problem. This was a calm and friendly presence. Despite what they were communicating to me, the presence wanted me to smash through. Hard to explain, but sort of like smashing a car at full speed into a concrete wall. I resisted. I knew that to do this meant we would be dead. I tried to communicate with the spirit that we shouldn't do this, but the spirit was so insistent. I had to do this. Not ominous, not malevolent, just calmly insistent. So I did. Smashed through. There was still no light, no sound, but now I wasn't attached to the ground. Just hovering, not flying. It wasn't heaven. It wasn't hell. It was just kind of without anything. I asked without speaking, is this dead? And the response came back without speaking, yes, this is dead. And you do not belong here. I snapped out of the experience and was just in a daze. Like, what the fuck was that? I didn't want to tell my husband. I didn't want to tell him that his wife just had a dream about being told to smash into dead and did it. But it was so bizarre and I was so uneasy about it that I just had to tell him. Two days later, I received a text. Leia had died by suicide, and it was on the night of my dream. I was in shock and so upset. Suddenly, it dawned on me that my visitor had been Leia. She knew how crushed I would be. She knew I would be suicidal. Somehow, she found her way to me to tell me that dead was not where I should be. Before this experience, I would have said that I believed in spirits. Now, I know that somehow they absolutely exist. I also have a profound sense now that no matter how depressed I feel, that suicide is never supposed to be an option for me. My meditation tonight was kicked off after two songs. Pucifer, The Humbling River, and then live lightning crashes. I really love and feel the humbling river and see it as a referencing the awakening and our golden future. 
The second song sent me into a deep, cathartic cry, as my grandmother passed away very recently. I was blessed to be by her side in the days prior. I cried hard and marveled at the beauty of existence, both life and death. After the crying subsided, I could feel my crowd and third eye chakras strongly active. I put on a guided breathing meditation track, which was literally just rhythmic breathing, which I came to notice was similar to the rhythm of breathing when falling asleep. The breathing was deep breaths in, short, quick breaths out. It gave me cold tingles like overlapping webs at my feet, hands, and chakras branching out into the body. I didn't fully follow the breathing, but went with what was comfortable after the sensations really kicked in. I could see a tunnel of small overlapping spheres as a structure behind the other hallucinations. I began meditating on no one, seeing in my mind's eye the letters spinning around with the E remaining in place, or the E rotating round. It highlighted the mirror nature of no on, and it became a shiny mirrored visual split down the middle. I then shifted to no one is watching, with no one now feeling like a presence. From there, I went on to do something I saw earlier today. I saw multiple instances of 222 and 22, 222 and such, followed by a car license place that read two eyes. So I meditated on two eyes, which morphed into two eyes. I then saw a face flickering back and forth in a hemi-sync like rhythm there was a red masculine visage and a blue feminine visage. They were also laid over each other. Anyway, it was red masculine and blue feminine still. Then the blue entity came through very strongly. I could really see her manifesting. For the first time, changing into various versions of herself, but always blue energy. The goddess, Anima, the female voice which often gives me messages... Aware of the mirror again, I asked her, how do you know which side of the mirror is real? She replied, they are both real. That's how a holographic fractal works. And I was shown that my partner is absolutely and definitely, specifically my twin soul. Our connection is very strong. And I had suspected something along these lines. This confirmed the specific nature of our connection. Exploring, I came across the thought of living a life and dying and having it mean nothing. There was a visceral dark pain there, so I lingered to clear it out. Someone told you that your existence was meaningless and part of you believed them and was very hurt, she said. So I asked her, what's the meaning of my life? After a few moments of me pondering what meaning there could possibly be, the reply to truly appreciate the beauty of existence. I saw two op op oppositely spinning dark vortexes and the eye again. I went through the eye and the visuals became twice as vivid. When the energy focus settles at the sacral chakra, I can feel love overflowing from it, filling up my body. I also felt the full line of the root chakra, the physical lifeline of the chakra system. It flows from the base out through the genitalia. The third eye today was very powerfully activated, connecting all the way through in a line as well, to the well of dreams chakra in the back, which struck me as being more importantly the visual cortex. I'm searching the chakra system for an endogenous release of DMT. The visuals are strong, but I'm not certain if I've found it yet. Not in the way that the sacral chakra fills me with love. At some point in the middle, I was feeling all three eyes equally. It felt like all three were partially submerged in cool water. As I continued to focus on this, I noticed tears slowly making their way down my face without any of the normal feelings or emotions associated with crying. I could just feel the flow, and so they were flowing. At the very end of my meditation, I was very vividly and clearly rickrolled by the anima. Cheeky, but also very sweet. Another important thing reinforced last night, by increasing our unconditional love, we unlock more of our hidden self directly.
Since my separation from the Navy three years ago now, I've been working part-time doing security at the local bars and clubs. I recently just finished my last two days, thankfully, because I now have more time to spend with my five-month-old son and wife without feeling drained from working six to seven days a week. Don't ask how I did it. I don't know. A few months back, I was working at one of the aforementioned local bars. It so happened to be one of my favorite spots to work. Good food, decent pay, and all around amazing people. There were hardly any fights, so my job mostly consists of escorting or throwing people out when they're too blitzed, or kicking out sailors after curfew. Well, you get ill, have a good time, and chat with drunk customers. Then my wife called me. That's weird, I thought. It's 2 a.m. I'm not gonna lie, I got a little anxious. I mean, we do have a freshly buttered baby in the house, so I'm sure you can understand. She told me she couldn't sleep because of a nightmare. I finally let my breath go. I told her I couldn't talk too much on the clock, so I told her to just message me. We began texting each other and I asked about her nightmare. I wish I hadn't. She began to describe the recurring nightmare, beginning with her sleeping alone in our room. She woke up to a man sitting on our bed. Frozen in fear, she can't say anything, but he begins to speak. You know, for a long time I've been watching you. I want your baby. When he finally turns to her, she can only make out a pair of red eyes. I then asked what his voice sounded like. She said his voice was so deep that it didn't sound like something that could come from a human. She continued to tell me the rest. He then walks into my son's room, grabs him, and then disappears. She's been having that dream around the same time that I was having mine. It's been months since either of us have dreamt about him, although recently, my closets now have a very heavy and dark feeling to this day. Like he's just waiting for that day to strike. Fast forward to now. We introduced the new year and things were feeling pretty light until two nights ago. My wife began talking in her sleep around 3 a.m. Normally, I didn't wake up until 4. So that's when my son decides to be an ass and wants to play with me. She kept saying, no, no, don't take him. He's not yours. I began feeling that sense of dread and malice from my dreams about the red-eyed man in the closet. Same as when I was you and still the same now. I jumped up, scaring my wife and running to my son's room only to find the room a lot darker than usual, even with the blinds open and his nightlight on. The worst part, the absolute thing that filled me with fear, rage and confusion was that his closet was wide open. A five month old infant can't climb out of a crib and open two heavy fucking doors. After seeing that, I told my wife to pack a bag at least for a few days. They're currently staying at my in-laws house in the countryside. Being a very traditional Japanese family, I know that they have a lot of talismans and protective barriers around the house. I've been home alone for two days and two nights. I do feel that feeling of being watched at times, yet I try to apply logic first being a veteran and all, but sometimes logic really cannot make sense for the things that go on in my house. I have a priest and a shaman coming to my home today. I hope it works for now. Among the Sami people, we have many sayings that we use when something is going to happen. Examples are, if your nose is itchy, then you'll become angry. If a reindeer is running around, then a storm is on its way. If there are a lot of insects in the summer, then the berry season will be good. But one of the sayings is about the fox and its scream. There was a small Sami village. They lived in Lavas, similar to Native American teepees and moved with their reindeer herd, following them as they moved over the tundra. There was a family living there, consisting of three brothers, each with their families. They were starting to become old, with them all being in their 60s. One day, when the oldest brother called Johan was outside making skis for his grandson, he saw something coming out of the nearby forest. It's a fox. He thinks it's odd, as the foxes never come out in broad daylight, 
But this one just sits there, looking at him. Then all of a sudden, it starts screaming. It screams loudly, and it won't stop at all. Then out came Johan's son. Angry, he was about to send his dog after the fox. But Johan stopped him. He tells his son, don't chase the fox away. It's just come to tell me that I'm going to die. Johan's son stops and looks at his father, a bit concerned about his father's words. The fox disappears back into the woods. They all gather at Johan's lavu, asking him what he meant about the fox. He calmly says, the fox has done nothing wrong. He just came to tell me my end is near and that you shouldn't be surprised when I don't wake up these days. Sure enough, three days later, Johan had passed away in his sleep. They decided to bury him in the forest, near a small river that he liked to sit by. As they were digging the grave, they saw something coming from the trees. It's the fox again. It just sits there looking at them. They went to the grave each day of the week, and sure enough, the fox was there, looking at them in silence. When she was around 11 years old, they used to live in lavus, similar to Native American teepees, between two mountains, with two small towns also in each fjord. She's 60 years old now. She was young and they didn't have a car to travel with. One day, her mother, my grandpa's sister, asked her if she would go down to the large marsh and cut some grass. We used to cut grass that we put into our fur shoes to keep our feet warm and dry. Those grasses found in forest marshes are the best to use. They packed some food, took their sickles and walked down into the forest in the marsh. Their dog was also really excited to come along. They started cutting and gathered quite a lot of gas throughout the day. The midnight sun had started appearing when her mother decided that it was enough. They had packed a huge cloth piece and tied them between two trees. They decided to stay there for the night. They lay under it, safe from all the blood-sucking insects. The dog is also sleeping with them. Then all of a sudden, her mother sits up. The dog also raises its ears. She asks her what's going on. Her mother tells her to be quiet. Then she hears it, voices. They hear voices coming from the woods. They both go outside to check, but immediately when they go outside, it turns quiet. They think that it was probably people fishing or drinking. They go back inside to sleep again. Then just as they were about to fall asleep, the voices are heard again, this time even closer. This time they can hear that it's a language they don't understand. Again, they go out and check, and sure enough, the voices stop. Again, they go inside to sleep, but she sees that her mother is not sleeping, so she's also wide awake. Then again, the voices are heard. They hear just one word, and they know what language they're speaking. That word was Hitler. Her mother told her to stay inside with the dog while she goes and checks. Sure enough, there's no one there. Her mother comes inside again. She says that there was no one there. She also says that it's just the marsh that's playing with them, and that they could sleep peacefully. So my aunt does fall asleep. The next morning when she wakes up, she looks at her mom. She sees that she hasn't slept the night and has been up. They decide to quickly pack up and walk back home. So in the place we have huts now, which is above the marsh and the forest, there's a small bunker close to the road. It was used in World War II for something, and it still stands there to this day. Sixty years ago, when she was just a child, she and her family would move with their reindeer to the tundra by the summer. She lived with her parents, three older brothers and one older sister. The sisters are the youngest and they like to run among the hills and play all day. One day, a friend of her father, my great grandpa, had come to visit. He was a city man and he wanted to have a little break from the city. He came to them and stayed there for a week. They fished, gathered berries, and had a good time. He was a nice man, and was really nice to the children, 
giving them candy and everything. On the last day before he was leaving, he decided to take a stroll among the hills. He walked a little bit before noticing something. Two girls playing on a small hilltop. He just laughed. Those sisters are so nice. They just like to run among the hills all day. I hope my children also get to experience the same. He returns to their camp. He mentions to my great grandpa, I saw your daughters running around just now, a little bit south of our camp. He was met with silence. My great grandma said, that can't be. Our daughters have been here the whole day. The man felt cold coming down his spine. He ran back to the place where he had seen them. Sure enough, there was no one there. He ran back a bit worried. My great grandma said to him, don't worry, it's just older children that have come out to play. They aren't dangerous, but take this needle with you just in case you meet an older woman. They can try to kidnap you if you aren't able to defend yourself. So the man hurried all the way down from the tundra and back into the city. I've been living in an octagon house built in 1855 for over 20 years and have experienced some things over the years which I have posted in the past. The last major event occurred as my family and I sat down for Thanksgiving dinner around 4pm in our kitchen on the first floor of our two floor single family home. Shortly after everyone was seated, I distinctly heard unmistakable footsteps on the second floor above the kitchen where nobody was at the time. The steps continued in what sounded like movements across the upstairs room and then down the stairs directly outside the open kitchen doorway. The steps then began to approach me from behind, although I didn't look back since it all happened really fast. I could actually feel the thumping of the floorboards as the footsteps approached. Before I had a chance to say anything, my youngest daughter looked under the table and said to me, Oh, you're doing that, Dad. I said, No, it's not me. And you heard and felt that too? It was creepy to say the least, and the weird thing is that only my younger daughter and I heard or felt anything. My other daughter and wife didn't have a clue what we had experienced. The unique thing about this experience is that only my youngest daughter and I have experienced things in the house. Never my wife or older daughter. Makes you think we're tuned into these experiences more than them. I've owned my octagon house built in 1855 and has eight equal sides for about 18 years. Just recently, I've experienced some things I can't explain. This story is 100% true and I'm not a person who necessarily believes in ghosts or spirits, etc. So I'm not jumping to any conclusions or ready to sell the house just yet. About six months ago, my wife and I were having issues with my 10 year old daughter sleeping in her bed. She would run into our bed every night. Not unusual as I'm sure anyone with children can attest. One night, my daughter ran into our room and jumped into the bed, taking up all the room and blankets. I decided to get up and sleep in her bed for the night. At about 3am, I was sleeping on my side facing my daughter's bedroom door. I opened my eyes without moving at all and right in front of me was a dark shadow of a short person or child looking at me. No features at all, just like a black cloudy slash smoky form that had a volume to it, not two dimensional. I didn't move or blink for about 15 or 20 seconds and it just blew away to my right. Surprisingly enough, I didn't jump out of my bed and run or anything like that. I just rolled over on my back and started to ask myself if I had really seen what I thought I did. I then looked at my phone on the floor and it was about 3.15am. After laying there for a couple minutes, I started to get scared about what I saw and returned to my bedroom where my wife and daughter were sleeping. I climbed into bed with them and eventually went back to sleep. In the morning, I told my wife but not my daughter. I never would since I didn't want to scare her. I had since tried to write this off as sleep paralysis or something like that, but deep down, I knew I was sure I was awake. 
it gets crazier. Just last week, my family and I were out to dinner and the subject of ghosts came up. I asked my daughter if she had ever experienced anything she couldn't explain. Remember, I never told her about my experience. She then said one night in her bed, she woke up and saw the shadow of a girl floating near the door. I of course didn't tell her I did as well, but my wife and I locked eyes and she said we were both crazy. There have also recently been some other things happening with electronics acting up, phones coming on in the middle of the night, playing videos and the TV changing channels, but thank God no shadow people. My dog has also been barking and growling at things in adjacent rooms at times when nobody's there. About eight years ago, I was a field technician for one of America's largest cellular carriers. Part of my job was being on call about one week a month for after business hour network issues. This particular event just happened to fall on, believe it or not, Halloween night. Sounds like the start of a fictional story, I know, but this is 100% true with no exaggerations. As is often the case when on call, the chances that you're going to get called about an issue just as you're jumping into bed for the night. On this night, Halloween, at about 12pm, I was getting ready for bed and said to my wife that the only place, cell site, I wouldn't want to get called out to, to fix, was a particular old church built in the 1820s, not far from my town. It was an old wooden colonial New England church that had at least one grave inside the chapel, containing the original minister from the early 1800s. Our cellular equipment was located in a small locked room in the steeple, just below the bell, with a combination only people that worked for my company knew. Well, wouldn't you know it? Just as I mentioned to my wife about the church, and my head just about to hit the pillow, my phone rang. It was the NOC, the National Operations Centre, calling to inform me that a radio was down, and they wanted me to head to the site ASAP to troubleshoot the issue. To put it into perspective, there were about 2,000 cell sites at this time in the network I was on call for. I said, okay, what site? And they said the site was assigned to the old wooden church. My heart dropped and my pulse picked up. I then asked what they thought the issue was since they could usually see the alarm type prior to dispatch. The NOC said they had never seen this happen before without someone on site. But the radio set itself into local mode. Local mode is a function on the radio equipment that can only be done by pushing in a button on the face of the radio while on site. You would not be able to do it with remote access. I calmly said okay, and that I would take care of it, and hung up the phone. Needless to say, I stayed in bed, waited an hour, and called the NOC back to inform them that the key was missing, and the issue would need to be fixed in the AM. There was no way I was going out to see who, what, how the equipment was tampered with. In the morning when I did arrive, sure enough the radio was powered on and all I had to do to recover the equipment was push the button and take it out of local mode. About two years ago, my wife and two daughters took the PATH train from Jersey City Manhattan's Penn Station. We exited the station and stood on the sidewalk as I tried to hail a cab. The day was sunny and bright without any clouds from what I remember. I stepped off the curve with my wife and girls standing behind me in a group on the sidewalk. As I had my right hand up in the air to get a cab's attention, out of the corner of my eye I saw a tall black shadow of a man with a large brimmed hat in what appeared to be a long coat standing extremely close behind my family. So close in fact that I remember it bothered me that anyone would be so close to them. And being NYC, who knew what their intention was? At that moment, I turned my head to the left to get a better look and to my surprise, for a split second, I saw the faceless black shadow that scared the crap out of me. It happened so fast. I did a double take and it was fully focused. It was gone. I just said wow and my family looked at me weird as I looked up and down the street trying to see someone that would have caused me to see what I saw. 
I looked at the building and shadows on the windows behind them to make sure it wasn't a shadow from across the street. I didn't see anything that would have caused it, and by the time a cab had stopped and was waiting for us to get in, which we did and drove away. I was very freaked out to say the least, and was worried about my vision and thought maybe I was having issues with blind spots and shadows etc. I even feared that maybe I was having a hallucination for some reason and worried that it could be something that doesn't go away. I decided not to tell my wife and to see if I saw something similar for a few days. Thank God for the next few days I didn't have any sightings and told my wife who thought it was interesting but didn't pay much attention to it. A few weeks after we got home I googled Hatman, not knowing anything about it or that it was even a thing, but was shocked to see others have reported the same thing. The locals tell us that at the end of the 19th century, there was a house in this place. Anastina Samuel's daughter lived here. It is said that she was a prostitute. In the 19th century, prostitution was even considered a medical need. Healthy men were judged to need to visit prostitutes to maintain their health. But Anna became pregnant and the children she gave birth to were killed and hung up in the tree. This is said to have caused all the branches of the tree to grow in the same direction. Those who have visited the child murderer's cross say that they have heard baby crying and seen light bulbs coming up one road and then disappearing into the forest. Whatever the case of the stories, the secluded location, the overgrown foundation of the house and the strange tree the child murders us cross make it a rather spooky and haunted place. There's a well-known story about a young couple who must have pitched their tent at the child murderer's cross to spend the night. They suddenly woke up to a deafening baby cry. Panicking, the couple fled the scene and left both tents and belongings behind. They never returned to pick them up. I'm very interested in the paranormal, as is my friend, so we thought it sounded like a great idea to go there. After all, I had an EMF meter, which senses the surroundings. We went there during the day. I'm not stupid that way. When we got there, we saw that the tree had become so vandalised that only the stump was left. But people have painted upside down crosses on other trees. The tree has always been seen as the evil that exists on the site, and therefore people have probably destroyed it. But when we were there, my friend was a little nauseous. She's a little sensitive to paranormal stuff. We walked around and looked a bit for the foundation of the house. We found it a little further from the road. I got some reaction to EMF, but not much. My friend and I looked at each other and decided to walk around the open plan next to the foundation. Just as we stood there asking questions, it was like, well, it got quiet. We might have heard some bird before, but now it was so deafeningly quiet. I looked in among the trees and got a very familiar feeling in me. That someone was watching us from the trees. You know that feeling you get when you know that someone, maybe a friend, who is hiding to jump out and scare you? You say, ha, I knew you were there. That was the feeling. So if I had approached one of the trees and looked behind it, I would surely have found something. That feeling. But the security of the light from the day kept us calmer. Had it been night, we would have easily died of fear. Then it would be harder to see something. I looked at my friend and asked if we should go when we both started to feel anxious. My friend had crouched down a bit and held her stomach and said that she was feeling unwell and how it was burning in her neck. I looked but couldn't see anything. She told me it was like a burning sensation and I said yes, now we go. When we got to my car and when I was about to pick up the key, we heard a big bang from my car. Like someone stomped hard on the car floor. It has not sounded like that before. We looked at each other. Me, not my car. Friend, did you hear that? Just when we're leaving too, it sounded like it came from the trunk. No, do not say she's hiding in the luggage. I opened the luggage, but nothing was there. We looked everywhere, but nothing was there. We jumped in. I looked at my friend and said, look now when I'm not starting. I pulled the key. 
It was a bit sluggish, but went and started. When we drove along the forest, the feeling wasn't over. But when we saw civilization again, we could finally breathe a sigh of relief. During the third lockdown in the UK, January to March 2021, I was up in Derbyshire with my family. I'm a student, so I was in my last year of sixth form then. To do online school on Zoom, my parents suggested I go to the vacant cottage that my parents usually use as an Airbnb, so that I wouldn't be disturbed by the noise of the house, with both parents working over Zoom and my younger sibling doing online school. This cottage was built by my great-grandfather, so my family inherited it. It's been renovated and looks relatively modern on the inside, but it's quite a quiet little village, and although not isolated, it can sometimes feel a little bit lonely. I would often sleep over there to finish my work and just relax rather than getting my parents to have to drive out to take me home. And every night I did so, I would lock up at around 6.30 p.m. However, one night it must have slipped my mind to lock up after finishing my homework and I just went upstairs and took a bath. I came downstairs, watched some TV and I realized I couldn't remember if I had locked up or not. So I went to the front door and noticed that the keys weren't on the table next to it. For context, I would always leave my keys on that table without fail. I then checked to see if the door was locked and of course it wasn't. The door swung out to the darkness outside. I closed it and started to retrace my steps, not yet too concerned about its whereabouts, just thinking I'd had it in my hands and put it somewhere stupid. So I've opened almost every drawer in this cottage, looked in the fridge, through the bins, in case I'd accidentally thrown it out with something, checked all my pockets, my bag, etc. Almost every place, including absurd places just to be sure. It wasn't anywhere. I decided to go back downstairs again and start all over again for the third time, starting from the front door. When I saw the keys there, on the table, placed perfectly straight, and neat and pointing toward me. I had checked that table twice and hadn't seen it before then, yet there it was, perfectly in plain sight and right where I would usually leave it. I was immediately on edge. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It was so unnerving to see it reappear in the most tauntingly obvious place possible. My first reaction was to grab a large kitchen knife and call my dad to come over as I thought that maybe someone had crept into the cottage whilst I was bathing and was taunting me, playing mind games. He rushed over, checked over the whole house, but there was no one in the cottage except for me and him. He laughed at me for not looking properly and no amount of assurance would convince him that it just appeared. Once I knew that it wasn't an actual knife-wielding maniac, I felt fine again. But when I came home, my mum told me that my uncle had had a paranormal experience there too. My uncle works as a builder slash plumber slash electrician and he did some renovations in the attic. He's never lied in his life. In fact, he tells the hard truth 100% of the time, even if it would be better to say nothing at all. He told my mom that when he was in the attic in the dark, he heard an old woman's voice in a low tone ask, hello? Apparently he bolted out of there. She didn't really tell me much else. There's another story too. When we were younger, we temporarily lived in the cottage when our house experienced some issues with the water pipes. One night, our babysitter experienced a sort of sleep paralysis, where she said she saw a shadowy figure of a woman come into her room and begin to choke her. When she woke up, she had her hands around her neck and was coughing and spluttering. I don't know how much sleep paralysis plays into the paranormal, so I didn't know whether to include it here, but maybe it could be connected? Anyway, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on these events that have taken place in the cottage. As far as I know, no one who's used the Airbnb has complained of any issues. <laughs>